Thank you for coming. Bienvenidos. Um, my name is Francine Ken, and I am privileged and honored to introduce to you my husband, Herb Kemp. And I want to say just a, a few things about him. First of all, you know, he married a Latina. We say once bitten, forever smitten. <laughs> 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 and that's what happens. And we tell them we let you in, and we're the ones that let you out. <laughs> um, he, we got married. We went around the world uh, 14 times and raised our children overseas, planted trees everywhere we were, pets. Cars on this side, cars on that side, you know, lost furniture, bought furniture, you know how that goes, right? Never had a house with the furniture and the curtains ever fit. But somehow or another, we landed up here in Herndon. And my husband has been very successful in his life. He has had, um, and I have feel it's been a very a blessing in my life that he has always been true to me, true to his core values of patriotism, integrity, honesty. He keeps his faith. And he's been a wonderful husband grandfather, um, father, and son. And he cares for my mother in South Texas. He loves her like it's like she's his own mother. And um, they are very uh, privileged to have him in our family. I am very happy that he's made this choice because I've been wanting him to do this for a long time. Finally, I said to him, I don't want to hear you talking anymore. Get off that sofa and do something or forever be quiet. So he's here, and I am thrilled that he's taking this, uh, this chance to do something for his country again. He is a patriot. Public service runs in our family. I've been doing working on campaigns since the age of nine, and that's 50 years. So I'm 62 years of age, and I've been doing it since the age of nine. And I will not stop. I am a screaming Democrat, OK? And I want. You all to know that if you entrust her with your vote, he will do a great job for you. He will not forget his oath. He will not forget what he has pledged to do for you. And I know that he will dedicate himself, not 100%, but 1,000% to whatever mission you ask of him. He will be a servant leader, and he will understand that the reason he's there is to protect the Constitution, which we all need to have protected and to make certain that Virginia is the place that we love and want to live in. So here's my husband, Herb Kemp. Thanks, honey. Well, thank you for coming. I am Herb Kemp, and I am running for delegate. Yeah. Hey! <laughs> First, I'd like to introduce my, my campaign committee. Uh, good friends who have uh, decided to pitch in their lot with me and, uh, and help me through this, uh, this journey. So in the back there is Heidi Zolo. Heidi's our yeah. campaign coordinator. Yeah. Ann Alston. Yeah. Ann, is, yeah. Ann is our volunteer coordinator. If she hasn't talked to you already, she would like to. Okay. Um, Roberta Dobbins. Robert yeah. Roberta is our principal researcher. She's the one that keeps me smart on all the issues and keeps me current, and we really appreciate it. And she can knock those things out in a heartbeat, too. It's amazing. So, we have uh, Randy, uh, our treasurer, <laughs> and his wife, Pam. And we have an amazing uh, media team uh, that produced everything you've seen today. Judson Vaughn, Eric Kemp, <laughs> my son Eric, and his wife, Glenn Ann, in the back. We thank you for all the graphics artists here. So what I'd like to do is spend uh, a few minutes telling you a little bit about myself, why I'm running, what I bring to this, and we'll talk to some of the issues. And I'll be happy to entertain questions after we're done. A little bit about myself. Some of you have known me longer than others. Uh, one of my oldest friends is here today, by the way, Chuck Purcell all the way in the back. Chuck and I served in Okinawa in 1976, and we've been friends ever since when we came today. We've also got Cheryl Pepper from uh, service with the, Pen the Pentagon with me, more recently in my career. <laughs> and our good friend uh, Cheryl M&M, &M, right there, so we'll serve later on. So a lot of good people from uh, old friends and new friends, and I thank you all for coming here today. I served 28 years as an Air Force officer. Uh, it was uh, an interesting career. It was a career that took me to 31 countries over the course of that time. During, uh, I went to the Far East, the Middle East, Europe, Latin America. 
It was my privilege to serve with and work for and interact with uh, amazing young uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines that uh, populate our armed forces, and uh, all the way up to uh, generals, uh, cabinet secretaries, heads of state, princes, and others. Uh, as Francie mentioned, uh, we made a number of global moves. During the course of our marriage, we were separated for probably a third of that time uh, with the deployments that I was having to make. When we arrived here in Virginia, it was actually, we moved into our 19th home. And we have actually lived here longer than anywhere, at least for me, that I've ever lived in my entire life now. We chose to be Virginians, and we retired and settled here. Over the next 10 years after that, I worked in the defense industry. I was an executive in uh, two different companies, and now I'm involved in the startup of a third. So I've worked on uh, both the private sector uh, and in government. So why am I running? Well, the first part is easy. I've already spent the majority of my professional life in public service. It's in my DNA, it comes naturally, but that answer on its own is probably not enough. I've seen much of the rest of the world, and one of the things that that has done is it makes me appreciate the democracy that we have here, the strength of it. It also makes me understand just how rare that democracy is in this world. If you saw my post at the uh, elections uh, on the inaugural day, uh, that kind of an event, the peaceful transfer of power, affirmation of power, is still a rare thing in this world. So we have a secure democracy. We need to continue to work to protect it and secure it and, uh, and savor it. So we worked in the uh, 2008 campaign for Obama. We worked uh, in 2012, as Francie mentioned, during the 2012 campaign in particular. We opened up our house, used it as a staging area. It's where I met many of you. And we got particularly impassioned by the issues in that campaign. And over the course of that period of time, I had the opportunity to talk to a number of, you know, probably hundreds of uh, uh, very committed, very passionate Democrats. And we had great conversations about a number of issues. And then people began to ask me, Herb, given the way you feel, given how passionate you are about this, why aren't you running for office? And I had to do some introspection and ask myself that question. Why am I not? And I came to the conclusion that it was time to step back into public service in some capacity. So then why here? Why now? Well, if not now, when? You know, now's always the best time. And I decided that I needed to enter at a level where I could actually work on the issues that are uh, of concern to me and where I can actually make a difference. And I believe that that is enrichment uh, working for you. So what do I bring to this? Knowledge of the issues is obviously important for any politician, any legislator to be effective. But knowledge on its own is insufficient. You have to be able to take that knowledge. It is important that you are able to take the knowledge, you turn it into action, you produce solutions, you solve problems with that. And that's what I can do. That's what I've been doing for 40 years. What I bring to this is a skill set of leadership skills that I have honed over, for, for, over 40 years of professional life, both in the military and in the private industry. You as a taxpayer has helped to pay for a lot of the leadership skills that I learned. So you could look at this as a potential return on your investment. <laughs> But I have managed billion dollar programs. I have commanded organizations with hundreds of people in them. I have led in organizations in the private industry with hundreds of people. I've been responsible for profit and loss. I've been responsible for uh, managing the taxpayers' dollars. I understand these big complex issues. I've been responsible for running some fiendishly complex technological programs. I've supported multilateral, bilateral negotiations. So what I bring to this is leadership of two types. Leadership as executive leadership of the buck stops here on my desk variety. I also understand collaborative leadership and getting things done through groups and peoples where you have to actually work to come to common ground. I can apply those on your behalf. So now let's talk about the issues. And I won't go through the, a lengthy list, but some are really important. I think we have to talk about those today. You know, every, every election is, it's a bet on the future. That's the choice that we make when we vote for people in elections. We see a future that we want for ourselves, we want for our children, and we try to pick the people that we think are in the best position to help take us there. This, this election is no different. So the issues, they really fall into two groups at the end of the day. There's one set of issues that has to do with providing us with a high standard of living here in Northern Virginia and throughout the Commonwealth for all of our citizens. There's a second set of issues, which is about the kind of society that we want to live in. Both of those are important. Let me talk to them individually. To the first, we stand here at the dawn of the 21st century. 
we live in a 21st century economy. The economy doesn't operate all on its own. We have to do things, we have to make investments to ensure that that economy can continue to provide the quality of life that we need. And some of those are public investments, some of those are private investments, some of those are public-private partnerships. But a 21st century economy needs a 21st century infrastructure. Now transportation roads are the first things to come to mind. They're obviously not the only things, because we also need infrastructure in terms of reliable, clean, and affordable energy from environmentally acceptable sources. We also need to have technological infrastructure, our fiber, our communications, our data centers, all of the things we have here in Northern Virginia that make this a vibrant economy. But transportation is certainly the most urgent. The state has underfunded transportation, particularly the road network, for decades. And saving taxes in the short term is a wonderful idea until the bill comes due. It's a little bit like saving money by not changing the oil in your car. Uh, it, it looks fine in the short run. At some point, that engine will need an early overhaul. Ladies and gentlemen, we need an overhaul in our transportation system. We're there. And I'm not optimistic at this point that we'll get uh, a good bill coming out of the legislature. It, it doesn't look like it's going to happen this session. So uh, that just pushes the problem down the road. And we'll need to pay attention to it, or we will become less attractive economically to businesses that want to come here. <laughs> because we live in a 21st century economy, we need to have the knowledge-based workforce, the educated workforce that actually supports that economy. And we need to train and prepare our children to enter that economy. And that means we need a 21st century education system for kindergarten through college. We have to pay attention to those things. Those are not expenses. Those are investments in the future, and we have to make them. And that means we have to provide our children both with the basics as well as the new skills that they need. It means we need to pay teachers what they're worth so we get the best talent and keep it. All right. And, a, and it means that we need to set the conditions for success in our schools for our teachers so then concentrate on teaching and not on bureaucracy. <laughs> so, those things are important, they're vitally important. But taken alone, they're not enough. Because we also need to live in the kind of free and open society that we all want to live in. And that's important. The first obligation of any government, ours included, is to keep its citizens safe and free. And I would submit that we're not doing as well in either of those as we need to be. The topic of the day is gun violence. We've had a, uh, a rise of uh, gun violence. We've had increasing numbers of mass shootings. Uh, the horrible tragedy at Newtown uh, simply was the final, uh, latest chapter in that. We absolutely have to do something about it. And if not now, when? So I won't go into details today. There are a number of issues associated with this. What I will say is I support the president's agenda, and I will do everything in my power to make it happen. <laughs> Finally, the issue of civil rights and human rights. You know, when I was an Air Force officer, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, all of it. And I have a particular passion for the rights that are included in there and the Bill of Rights and the rights that we enjoy as citizens. So I get concerned when those rights are infringed, when they're not enjoyed by all the citizens in our commonwealth, and we need to focus on that. So what do I mean when I say civil rights? And I, and I, I don't use that word lightly. I don't think of these as social issues or anything. They're civil rights. It's civil rights when someone tries to suppress your vote. It's a civil rights issue when someone tries to gerrymander districts to delete your vote. It is a civil rights issue when we attempt to tell a woman what she can do with her body. It's a civil rights issue when people of different groups still live under the possibility of discrimination or intimidation, whether for race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, for any reason. No citizen in our commonwealth No citizen in our commonwealth should ever fear discrimination or intimidation because of who they are, how they live, where they choose to worship or not, whom they choose to marry or live with. None of those are the business of the state. It is up to their individual consciences, and that's how we need to make it for them. <laughs> Finally, and I regard this as a human rights issue, we need to fix immigration. We need immigration for reform in this country. And I know the president intends to do that. There are varying issues on this. 
but I look back on my family's own history. My ancestors came to this country in the 1700s. They arrived in the colony of Georgia. They were poor, most likely indentured servants. They endured huge risks in crossing an ocean in a rickety ship at the time. They went to a place they knew nothing about, which had its own, uh, it, its own risks to it. And they were wandering off into the unknown. They went because they had faith that with their own, work of their own hands, that they could secure a better future for themselves and their children in this place called America. They and millions of people like them came to these shores and produced this thing that we call the American spirit. I see no difference between them and the people trying to come here today. They endure the same risks. They get here in different ways. They want the same things. Why would we not want to welcome them into our society? So this is a problem that we need to fix, and we need to fix it soon. So I'm asking for the honor to be the delegate from the 86th district. And if you send me to Richmond, I will work tirelessly on your behalf on these issues and others that you bring to my attention. But I need your help, and I'm asking for it now and here. So I thank you for coming today. I appreciate your time and attention, uh, and I certainly appreciate your support. I'd be more than happy to take your questions now, later, on conversation. But thanks again, and all have a great day. All right. All right. All right. <laughs>